Hello, everybody. This is Jacob Sapochnik with the Enchanting a Lawyer podcast, a show where we interview the most inspiring entrepreneurs, professionals uh, from all over the world that share their stories with us and inspire us to be better at what we do. And today we have um, an exciting attorney. Her name is uh, Gina Chaw, and she is a San Francisco bankruptcy lawyer. Along with her husband and law partner, she spends her days fixing clients' debt problems. She's also a big advocate of mindfulness. For those not acquainted with the term, think of it like a training tool for your mind. You can train your brain to reduce stress, anxiety, increase productivity, and happiness. And you can learn more about her law practice at jclawgroup.com and at theanxiouslawyer.com. And she has an upcoming ABA book that you can also find on that website. Um, Gina, I'm very happy that you are here. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Jacob. How are you today? I am doing well. How about you? I'm actually doing uh, even better now that I'm talking to you because I, um, you know, like I, like I told you, uh, when we started the show, um, I started um, doing a bit of meditation myself in the mornings the past few months. And, um, and I feel that it's definitely been helping uh, uh, me get through the day, uh, you know, more focused, more energetic. So thank you for your uh, inspiration for that. Oh, thank you. That's great to hear. And welcome to the club. All the cool kids are doing it now. I'm, I'm cool now, too. <laughs> so you know, I, I gave a little brief intro um, about you and your practice, but why don't you tell our listeners a bit more about yourself and what gets you where you are now? Sure. Um, so I do bankruptcy law, which means that I work with individuals and small businesses that have overwhelming debt. And I've been doing bankruptcy law since 2008. 2009, um, and I practice with my lovely husband, uh, which is a real joy. Um, prior to that, I worked as a district attorney in Tampa, Florida. So I went from graduating law school in Buffalo, New York. I got tired of the snow, hmm. so I moved to a sunny place in Tampa, and I and I did that for a long time. Um, and I just very quickly realized that that wasn't my calling, even though I grew up watching Law and Order. I was an immigrant, so I always thought, oh, if I can just become one of those, you know, prosecutors, I'll be able to set all the wrongs in the world and always get the bad guys. And of course, I'll be able to do this within a 60 minute segment, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I very quickly realized that reality um, was anything but that. So I really wanted to do something where I felt like I am working with people that I can relate to. And that's what I get to do in, in, my, in my work. I think many of us are really just you know, maybe two or three paychecks or an accident or some tragic event away from, you know, needing the help of a bankruptcy attorney. So it's really, I, I really relate to my clients and their stories. Right. And it's, it's you know, it's a very kind of humane uh, practice area. And, um, but now you are, um, you move to the, to the Bay Area. Yes, right. I live in the Bay Area. Yeah. Very good. And, um, and so how did you get into um, uh, the practice of mindfulness? And, and why don't you share with our listeners what it is exactly? Sure. So to be mindful means to be in the present moment without judgment or preference. Um, so I'll give you a perfect example. So uh, let's think about a typical morning, right? You know, as soon as you open your eyes, um, what typically happens for you? Well, maybe you're not the best example because now you've been practicing mindfulness. But thinking back to before you started practicing right. mindfulness, what would go through your mind as soon as you opened your eyes first thing in the morning? Well, you know, typically you think of, uh, oh, God, you know, I have all these things to do. Uh, this client is calling. Uh, you, know, you immediately think of the, 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 the bad things that are, are, are you have to take care of in the day. That's yeah. That's for me. Exactly, right. Or something maybe that happened yesterday. Oh, I yeah. can't believe that judge ruled against me. That was mm -hmm. so not right. You know, he got the law wrong. Um, so when we're doing that, we're not being in the present moment, right? We're either in the future, which we have no control over, or we're in the past, which we can't, of course, go back and fix. So to be in the present moment would mean just waking up in the morning, opening your eyes and 
like noticing what's happening. It's like, wow, I get another day. What a beautiful day. Noticing the weather. Maybe, you know, your spouse that's still sleeping next to you or, you know, or your kids that crawled into bed with you or just being present to whatever is happening in that moment without having our minds be somewhere else. Because we really end up losing out in our life by not being in the present moment, but rather having our mind constantly going and just sort of ruminating over things that disengage us from what is happening right then and there. Right. And so, um, you know, this is something that um, is, you, people can learn it and you can yeah. become better at this, right? Absolutely. Yes, that's the most amazing thing. So that, there are literally thousands of studies that show that you can actually train your brain and increase the function of your prefrontal cortex. So that's the part that's right behind your forehead. And it's the part of your brain that's responsible for um, executive decision making. So it's the part of your brain that you want to be in charge in the driver's seat. And they've done lots of studies that you can actually increase the function of this part of your brain by meditation and practicing mindfulness and actually shrinking um, your amygdala, which is a part of your brain that's responsible for the fight or flight response. And a lot of us are constantly in this sort of state of fight or flight response, right? You get a call from your opposing counsel, you see that caller ID number come up and you're just like, ah, oh, that jerk, he's calling me again. I just, and you know, you just kind of get yourself all riled up. And it's that like caveman or cave woman brain kicking into action, but instead of a saber-toothed tiger attacking us, it's our opposing counsel. And, you know, that response of fight or flight, your heart's beating faster, right? You start noticing tenseness in your body. You're literally getting ready to run or fight. is very helpful if a saber-toothed tiger is attacking you, okay. but not so helpful when it's your opposing counsel on the phone. <laughs> Right, so th this is some of the, the tools that we can use to to cope with this. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And, and Gina, before we um, continue with our um, uh, with our interview, I just wanted to you to share um, an inspirational quote um, with our listeners because I feel that everybody has, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm personally like quotes. I feel that it's uh, everybody has uh, a reason for why they like s a certain thing. So um, I'll be curious to hear yours. Sure. Um, so one of my favorite is by Maya Angelou, and it's, if you must look back, do so forgivingly. If you must look forward, do so pray prayerfully. However, the wisest thing you can do is be present in the present gratefully. Wow, this is a great quote. And, and I think it really resonates with what you uh, teach and what you uh, practice. Because, you know, we all, always hold grudges. We always kind of look back and try to analyze things that happened. Yeah. And if we find a way to um, uh, kind of let go. And, you know, we all, I mean, I, I, you know, we all do it. I still do it sometimes, but I try not to. Uh, but it's kind of a human nature to do this, right? Do, do you practice this? I do. And yeah, I, I absolutely do. And honestly, letting go of the past, it's not something you can will yourself to do, right? I mean, if we could only just tell our brain, let go of the past, and it would magically happen, we would all do it. Um, and that's really the beauty of practicing meditation and mindfulness is that we are, we are giving ourselves specific tools so that we can let go of the past mm -hmm. and we can sort of become aware of what our mind is doing. Um, so I think that's a very sort of a nuanced distinction. But when we practice mindfulness and meditation, it's not that we're forcing ourselves to let go of the past or to stop thinking about the future, but rather we can notice all these thoughts kind of float by, right? Like they're mm -hmm. like it, almost as though they're, you know, clouds in the sky, but we're not engaging with the content of it, right? So you can just have a thought mm -hmm. that says, oh, you know, 
the opposing counsel, he did X, Y, and Z. But it's sort of the emotional content behind it, right? It's like you actually engaging with that thought that causes us to get angry or frustrated. So if you can just recognize the thought as just being a thought and says, oh, that's my mind doing its thing. It's doing that thinking thing again Mm -hmm. and just let it go. You know, that's really the key. So it's not really about forcing your brain to stop thinking because that's never going to happen and we wouldn't want that to happen, but rather letting go of the emotional content behind the thought. Does that make sense? Right. And, and, and I think this is something that um, must be practiced because most people, they, um, you know, naturally will want to go back and analyze this and say, well, I could have done it differently. I, could, I shouldn't have said that. Um, and then once you learn how to let go, then it's it. You know, you continue and say, well, this ha- I, cannot, I cannot go back in time, which is hard for us to understand, I think, as, as humans. Right, right. It is definitely human nature. And, and also part of mindfulness is to accept that we are only humans, right? That right. We are going to make mistakes. You know, we're going to do things that we regret. And really having compassion for ourselves and others mm-hmm. or also being imperfect human beings. <laughs> That's true. Now, Gina, tell me, can you remember your life before you started pr- practicing mindfulness? Maybe uh, uh, share with us a story or an incident that kind of happened to you that maybe you realized that, listen, I need to do something different and, and get into this uh, um, new uh, uh, state of thinking. Yes, definitely. Um, so, uh, you know, when I first started practicing mindfulness, um, I think... My, I remember my teacher saying that people come to mindfulness because they're suffering. And it was, and I was certainly no exception. Um, so I had this thriving bankruptcy practice, but I, I wasn't fully happy. Like I would, and my body was also telling me that something wasn't right. Like I would always get you know, like back aches and headaches and I'd have insomnias and when I talk to other lawyers about this, they all kind of nod in agreement. And I think, you know, it's, and it's our body's way of saying, hey, you know, I'm under a lot of stress, like something isn't working. Um, and in bankruptcy, I would just hear all these really sad stories, you know, of people ending up in dire financial situations because of death or illness or divorces or, you know, just really tragic things like losing jobs. And I would just carry all of my clients suffering with me all the time. Like, you know, at the end of the consultation, I would continue to think about the client. I'd lose sleep over it. I'd wake up in the middle of the night thinking about the client and the possibility of, you know, this couple with three young children losing their home. And, and I'd wake up thinking about it. And I was just constantly sort of walking around with all the suffering of my clients. Um, And I was engaged to now my husband and we were planning our wedding. And I think Uh, like planning the wedding was just like the one thing like that extra thing that I just could not handle in my life (laughs) because I started losing hair and not just a little bit of hair I was losing clumps of hair so here I am planning my wedding and I was about to become a bald bride (laughs) (laughs) and I just and I ran to the doctor and I was like oh my gosh something is wrong I'm dying from cancer or you know something horrible is happening to me and he ran like every test and he said Gina there is nothing wrong with you physically he said you know maybe you need to go see a psychiatrist maybe it's all in your head so sort of out of desperation I went and Um, And what the doctor said was, you know, that I had like some mild form of anxiety and depression. And I was like, what are you talking about? I feel fine. Um, And, you know, and the doctor just prescribed me a bunch of pills. And at that moment, I sort of realized, gosh, like I, I have a choice to make. Like I can either continue to medicate my way through life. Or I have to change how I'm living my life. Um, And thankfully, a good friend of mine um, who's a psychotherapist told me about this program called Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction. 
MBSR and she said, Gina, they're teaching this at Stanford. They're teaching it to, you know, first year undergraduate kids and they're teaching it to their MBAs and and their doctors. And I thought, okay, well, they're teaching it at Stanford. There must be something to this. And I started researching it and I found I mean, there are literally thousands and thousands of studies that show the effectiveness of the MBSR program. And I took this class and it literally transformed my life. I stopped losing hair, thank goodness. Um, but, you know, I just became so much happier, like, and not because anything changed, right? Like my life circumstances are still what it is. I'm still doing bankruptcy work. And, you know, the clients still tell me their sad stories, but it's really, I changed my relationship to my world and my surroundings. And really at the end of the day, that's all we have control over, right? Is our relationship to other people and what's going around us. Like we can't control the external environment. And we spend a lot of time trying to change or force those things when we really you know, it's it's sort of like spinning our wheels and not really getting anywhere. And you know, Gina, I think that you know this is first of all is a remarkable story because um, this is really what happens to uh, many of us attorneys. I mean, you know, I, I'm in my my practice is immigration law. I mean, this is what my my law firm does, and we have a similar kind of uh, background where we have clients who come in, they have depressing stories, somebody's been removed. They can come in, um, and and a lot of these attorneys who practice in this area, they really get sad and depressed over time. And of course, like you said, medication is what they do, and then yeah. substance abuse, and not just in our area, <clears throat> you know, criminal lawyers and family lawyers. Um, and there's no, it's kind of like a vicious cycle, and that's why we have such a bad rap as attorneys. And and I think that's why uh, mindfulness and one of those um, uh, natural ways of releasing uh, our frustration. And still continue to practice because we are the anchor of our clients, right? If we if we lose it, then who is, who is there to help them, right? Right. Yeah. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Self care must come first. Then, you know, I find it to be so sad. Like when you read all these statistics around lawyers, right? We're the fourth profession for uh, rate of suicide. You know, just mm-hmm. the rate of depression, substance abuse, mental illness is through the roof. Yet no one's really. It's sort of like the elephant in the room, but no one really wants to talk about it. Like no one's saying, "Wow, this is a huge." problem like you know well you know it's it's one of those it's one of those things where um you know it is a problem because it's happening to us on a daily basis we see attorneys who are being effective or you know it's whether they 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 stop practicing law or whether they 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 will they lose the will to practice law because they they just don't have the energy and this is one of the reasons it's happening right 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 or they're or they're practicing, but you know they're like you said they're medicating themselves, right? Mm-hmm. They're abusing drugs and alcohol, um, or they're suffering from depression and either don't know it or aren't getting treatment for it. Yes, I mean all of these things are really because we were never taught, right? Like we were taught how to, we were taught law, um, and I guess to a certain extent how to practice law, but we were never taught how to manage the stress and in these in the anxiety and you know how do you cope with all this the the suffering of our clients and how do you deal with all the work and the demand that's put on us like we weren't taught that class in law mm-hmm. school that that is for sure and and there are many other things we they didn't teach us in law school, but you know that's for another podcast right. <laughs> That's definitely another you know, podcast. Gina, if you had to put, let's say, three main things, why you think uh, mindfulness is so important for attorneys, what would be those top three uh, reasons why people should get into this? Um, I think number one is to have less reactions. Mm-hmm and more responses. And what I mean by that is something happens, right? And we immediately have this knee-jerk reaction. There isn't that pause. You know, like like people say, like, count to 10 before you say something when you're angry. Uh, you know, it actually allows us to practice that. So instead of jumping immediately into action, we can actually just take that half a second to just 
pause for a moment and think about what it is that we actually want to do and what's the most appropriate response for the situation instead of just reacting. Um, And I think the second thing is that it really allows us to become aware of our life. So instead of just going through the motions of our life, like, you know, kind of doing the same old thing, going through the routine, it really sort of awakens you to all the amazing things that's actually happening in your life. And it really increases more joy and happiness. Um, and I think lastly, it allows you to allows us to be more compassionate. Like, you know, life, it's difficult. You know, it's not always difficult, but sometimes it is difficult. And it allows us to just really approach it with a lot more kindness and compassion and empathy. Right. So, and I think, you know, once people realize that this is something that they are um, they're missing, you know, hopefully that will encourage them to uh, at least explore that because, you know, we, we, you know we, we always like to try different things to improve our lives. And this is one of those things that require, it, you know, it does require some effort. I mean, how, how can, if somebody's asking this question, well, yes, I, I understand the reasons you just told me, but how can it improve my, uh, my practice, actually? I mean, if I'm going to be doing this on a daily basis, and maybe, I don't know if you have some examples to, uh, to share with us, but what are the, some improvements that people can see by, by doing this? Um, I, you know, I think, for one, it's really improved my relationship with my opposing counsel. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, uh, you know, I was a litigator. I was a district attorney, and it was sort of, you know, you tend to kind of see the opposing side as sort of, quote-unquote, the enemy, and, you know, we're in this sort of very adversarial situation and that can of course increase stress and you know a lot of times we feel angry and really frustrated at you know like I mean people talk about litigation as like going into war Um, and it's really kind of helped me see it in a different perspective so now I see it more as like we all have our role to play you know I have my role to play and you know and my job is to represent my client to the best of my ability and the opposing side they also have their role and they're also doing their best to try to represent their client to the best of their abilities but we're not enemies you know and and I really try to be as kind as I possibly can instead of approaching you know every case like um, like that quote, you know, if, you're, if your instrument in life is a hammer, like right. everywhere you see nails, that kind of thing. Um, and it's really just sort of helped me relax a little bit more. And, um, and, I, and I feel like as a result, I've become a much better lawyer because if you're not starting every single phone call with a bad attitude, right? And you really just try to be like, listen, like we have, you know, we have this thing that we have to resolve and what's the most efficient way for us to resolve it and what can I do to actually help you um, instead of like oh like you're my enemy and like we have to, we're trying to like kill each other kind of mentality right exactly so you know th- those are some of the things that uh, if we forget about them um, they just kind of pile up and we get this anger in, in us and then those are the cases that you hear you know read in the news the guy jumped in and you know, they fight in court um, you know, this <laughs> right. is because you know it's 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 not it's not happening in one day. It's kind of it's built built in. Yeah, yeah, but, um, but, and also just remembering that that common humanity, right? Because uh, you know, I, I mean, I like the opposing side. Like they're also, you know, like they, they have bad days, they have good days, they mm-hmm. have people that they love, they have people that they have difficulties with, just like me. So, like, kind of almost recognizing that common humanity and that thread between all of us um, you know that's really something that I learned through the practice of mindfulness right and, and again the, the relationship that we have with other attorneys with our clients this, this are, these are things that are make us most anxious because yeah. we don't know we cannot control these other people we cannot control if they're going to come to us uh, happy or sad and so that's why I think it's very important for us to work on, on us first and then we can deal with anybody absolutely but, Aside from dealing with people, I mean, I, I know in my practice, I get anxious where, you know, I have, you know, too many cases to deal with. You know, we have the, the employees at work. Um, you know, we have the email 
uh, 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 communication. Maybe give us some tips about, say, h- how do we deal with this email overwhelm, which to me is a huge, huge problem even today. Yes. Um, so email is, of course, I, I mean, there are days where I feel like, you know, I should just be an email lawyer because that's all <laughs> I do. I don't really do lawyering. I just do email. Um, so first thing about email um, is, have you heard the term email apnea? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. so in case your listeners um, aren't familiar with this term, um, email apnea is just what it sounds like. People literally hold their breath while they're checking their email, and it's that fight or flight response again going off. So if you can just remember to take a breath before you open an email, particularly if you know that the email is going to be something that's going to cause an emotional trigger, like you see the from and you see the subject line and you can feel your heart's pumping a little bit faster and you can sort of feel the adrenaline pumping through your body. See if you can just take a breath or two or three before opening the email. Um, Second tip I have is to not check your email all day long because we're literally adding adrenaline into our bodies all day long by checking emails all day long. And humans are not designed to have that kind of constant flow of adrenaline going into our system. Um, So not checking email first thing in the morning, um, which is a really, really hard habit to break. Um, But that's probably been one of the most productive tools that that I've learned is to not check your email um, to, you know, if you can get into a habit of checking it like twice a day and before you sit down to open your inbox to just take a couple of breaths, you know, cause right. when you're, when you breathe deeply and you allow the breath to flow all the way down to your diaphragm, instead of breathing in your chest, so you're almost hyperventilating, you're sending signals to your brain that says, Hey, Everything's okay. So you want to really practice that deep relaxation breathing. Um, and, you know, I, I mean, I, I also set up filters in my mm-hmm. inbox. So all of my emails from my clients go into a folder called clients. So it's not just I open my inbox and here's all these emails that's going to cause those triggers, right, those emotional triggers. Right. Um, and I... I deal with all the emails in my client folder, you know, at certain times throughout the day. Yeah, this is actually a, g- a great tip because, I mean, in my case, I I actually check uh, some of the email in the morning, and then I won't get to it until later in the day. Try to give myself space in the day to do other things. Um, but there are different tools out there. You can use the. I mean, Gmail has that that um, tool where you can. Uh, um, read the email and then answer it later or schedule when it's going to be sent out and different t- uh, different tools where you can sort the um, the, um, the mailbox like you ha- what, what do you use to um, to sort your email to break it down I, into clients or non-clients which is a, I think it's actually a great tip yeah I just set up a filter so a filter. when I yeah when I get a new client I put in uh, I make a filter that says from and then I'll enter the person's email address and I'll say skip inbox, send it into this folder. Perfect. Yeah, I think this is, this is actually a, a, a great way to say, you know what, I have to, to make sure that I answer my clients at least. And, you know, they're all going to be in, the, in, the, in that uh, folder. And so all the other things can wait maybe for the end of the day. And yeah. this way you have less stress, kind of, you know, things are cl- come down, maybe with a glass of wine, right? <laughs> it's easier to uh, to answer. So this is, I mean, email has been really a major issue for a lot of people, and I get emails from people asking questions about this, and this has been interesting. Um, what would you advise somebody who um, who comes in in the morning and then looks at their desk, all these files, and they just don't want to get into the office? They just, you know, they're, they're having all these things on your desk. Um, do you do you advocate um, kind of clear clearing the space and getting to stuff or? What is your take on that? Uh, so, I, so the one sort of trick that I use is when I, I so I, I, I almost always have a messy test, so I'll just Me kind of let that cat out of the bag. Um, but once in a while, I will just get to a point where the mess has reached critical mass, and 
I, I have to clean the desk. And the one trick that I found that works really well is to set a timer for 20 minutes. And it's and that's all I will just clean my desk for 20 minutes and like nine times out of 10 I can clear my desk within 20 minutes Mm -hmm. Um, and then I'll treat myself for 10 minutes by you know like going outside or enjoying the sun or I don't know eating a scoop of ice cream or whatever my you know reward is for doing cleaning my desk for 20 minutes but like setting the clock for 20 or setting a timer for 20 minutes and doing the things that you've been kind of pushing off and not getting done. Um, that would be one tip that, I, you know, that you can try and see if that works. Yeah, that's a great tip. I actually got um, a sand clock, you know, the one, th- those ones that you can kind of flip that's actually set on 25 minutes. Uh huh. So maybe I'll try that uh, probably at the end of the week because my desk is getting there. Yeah, uh, but but I find it I find it more productive for me where I have stuff on my desk where cause, you know because I know what, what they are because I you know it's my desk <clears throat> as opposed to not having them on my desk and then I I kind of worry that I'm not going to get to those things so it's been a kind of a way for me to um, to do it. it it has not caused me any stress but I know that some people they just um, they they get overwhelmed with things on their desk or on their files on their shelves and they don't get to do anything. So I think that tip is, is perfect because, you know, you just clear it once in a while and then you kind of you recharge and you can go again and start it. Right? Yeah, definitely. Um, and the other tip that I'll offer is, um, and this, this was very helpful for me, especially when I used to mm-hmm. suffer from in, insomnia, is I used to have a worry journal. And so if... Oh at night when I couldn't fall asleep. And I think this can work throughout the day. This doesn't only need to happen at nighttime. But if you're looking at your desk and you are you, and you can feel that anxiety rising because you're like, oh my gosh, I have so much to do, maybe pull out your worry journal and write down all the things that are causing you worry because then that will allow your brain to say, okay, everything that I need to do has now been written down. I'm not going to forget it because it's been written down. So so that will kind of give your brain to stop and not constantly go through that circle, right, of thinking about all the things that you have to do over and over and over and over, over again. Right. <clears throat> Since you're actually written it down, it kind of gets the stress off. Uh, yeah, excellent. That's a great tip. I like it. And, um, you know, Gina, I wanted to ask you, you have this um, hangout where you uh, meet with the attorneys um, and, and you, you practice uh, mindfulness. They, they, people can come from anywhere in the country. Uh, why don't you tell me about this more and, and tell us how it works? What do you do in the sessions? Yeah, um, so it's on Monday morning at 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Um, It's open to all lawyers across the country. Uh, If you're interested in joining, um, you can just drop me an email or you can go to my website, theanxiouslawyer.com. And what I do. the links in our uh, show notes, of course. Great. Um, And what I do is I just lead people through a very short 15-minute guided meditation. Um, And I'd be happy to just do like a very short two-minute meditation for um, for your audience if that's something that you're interested in. Um, Let's do it. Okay, great. Um, So it's it's literally 15 minutes and then afterwards we just go quickly around and we introduce ourselves say what we do and maybe share like one sentence about what the meditation was like and i'll usually get between four to google hangout caps out at 10 so sometimes Mm -hmm. i'll get as many as 10 but it's just a really wonderful way to build community and meet other lawyers that are also practicing mindfulness Um, and i found having a community having a support that will help you practice on those days where you just don't feel like practicing, which is, of course, when we need it the most. Um, It's really, you know, it's a wonderful way. And you don't have to leave your desk. You don't have to get dressed and go anywhere. You can literally do it from anywhere. Um, And you can just download the iPhone app. And and it's great because we can all see each other, hear each other. Um, Yeah, so it's a it's a great way to use the technology to bring mindfulness into the legal community. I love it. So uh, why don't we, why don't we do like a little, uh, um, a few minutes um, test, like how, how you do it. All right. So everybody who listens right now, uh, you can all uh, try it wherever you are in the world. Perfect. 
All right. So um, I've done this with groups of as many as 100 people. And so what I encourage you to do is on a scale of one to five, think about how stressed you are feeling right now. And, so and just, you, you know, uh, Gina, we have um, literally thousands of people who download this podcast on, on a monthly basis. So, you, may, you know, you may have thousands of people listening to this, doing all this at the same time. So who knows? Great. Yes. So I would love to hear the results of this because, like I said, I've done this with a group of as sure. many as 100 um, and I've never had this not work. So on a scale of one to five, just noting how stressed you are right now. You don't have to say it out loud. This is just for you. Um, so do you have your number in your head? Yes. Okay, perfect. All right. Um, so we're going to do like a two-minute um, guided meditation exercise. So you can do this sitting on the floor, um, but most people will just do it sitting um, you know, in their chair uh, behind the desk. So you want to make sure that both feet are firmly on the ground, and you kind of might need to sort of adjust your hips a little bit so you feel like you're grounded and sitting squarely in your chair. And you want to pull your back away from the back of the chair so you're not leaning up against the back of the chair. And making sure that your spine is upright, rolling the shoulders back a little bit because we all have a tendency to hunch because we're staring at our monitors all day. And aligning the neck and the head with the spine, allowing the eyes to close. And when you close your eyes, it's a very different experience because we use our eyes for so many things and we use it all day long. So just noticing what that sensation is like to be sitting here with the eyes closed. And now let's take three breaths, breathing in. And breathing out. Breathing in. And breathing out. Breathing in. And breathing out. And we're going to just spend the next minute observing our breath. So with each inhale, you can imagine that you're drawing in fresh energy. And with each exhale, you're releasing anything that you no longer need or is no longer serving you. And now we'll bring this practice to a close by taking three breaths again, breathing in and breathing out, breathing in and breathing out, breathing in. And breathing out. Oh, this is perfect. I feel really relaxed. Wonderful. This is this is really good. Great. <clears throat> so so people will will do this for fifteen minutes as they start their day, um, and um, you know I can see how that can get you into a very very relaxed and and um, uh, kind of a different state of mind. Yeah, and. You know, honestly, I tell people that are beginning meditators, mm -hmm. 
don't start by trying to do this for 30 minutes, right? It's like kind of like starting an exercise routine. Um, start with 60 seconds. If that's all you can manage, like set the expectation and the goal right. so yeah. low that it's almost impossible to fail. So like literally setting the timer for 60 seconds and just breathing and then adding a minute each day maybe is a great way to start. Um, and I'd love to hear from your audience if just doing that, I mean, that literally took two, maybe three minutes if you noticed a drop in your stress level. So, um, if, you know, I'd love to hear it either way. Like if your stress went through the roof after doing it, I'd also love to hear that as well. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and like I said, it's, it may bring people to think about, well, this is something that we've never done, and maybe it's something that we would like to, to try. So this is perfect. And Jeanette, as we come to the, um, to the close of our show, I just wanted you perhaps to share um, uh, any business advice or non-business advice that you want to share with our listeners that helped you uh, become successful in your, in your law practice business that we can all benefit from. Um. So, you know, a long time ago, my mentor told me that the best thing you can ever do for your business is to be the best attorney that you can. And I think a lot of times we kind of lose sight of that, like really doing great work for our clients is the best form of marketing there is. And I think we can get so trapped in like, oh, I got to do Twitter and I got to do SEO and do all these things that we sort of lose sight of that very sort of basic fundamental of just being like a kick-ass lawyer <laughs> right like the be the best in your trade whatever you do absolutely be the best. wow yeah i like that see this, most people don't think about that they just give you all this um you know um out of the roof um uh, ideas and this is just simple it's just just be as best as you can absolutely yeah Perfect. yeah i love that and um, so for, for our audience that want to find you, they can go to theanxiouslawyer.com um, and there's all the resources and, and, and tools we talked about. Yes. And, uh, and your upcoming book is coming up when? Next year? Next year. Uh, my manuscript is due in December That's and it. it'll be titled The Anxious Lawyer. Wow. I love the name. You didn't, Thank you. You didn't touch the enchanting lawyer. That's ours. So anxious lawyer is good. Yeah, I know. You know, I wanted the enchanted lawyer, but you know, <laughs> yeah. I was already taken. Perfect. I love the name, and um, uh, it was um, it was great to have you on the show. It was uh, it was a true pleasure. And um, this is Jacob Sapochnik with the Enchanting Lawyer Podcast. I would love to hear from you about the results of your of our pr little practice here, and any questions you have about what you heard today. Email me Jacob at enchantinglawyer.com, and we look forward to seeing you on our next uh, show.